All right. Well, hi, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Anna Yi. I'm a WCS board member and co-chair of the Entrepreneurship Committee. Um, welcome to this month's eCircle with Shai Kalonsky. The eCircle program is designed for entrepreneurs who identify as women to communicate, reflect, and connect with one another. And we're going to run these almost every month. So welcome if you're new to the program and welcome back uh, for any returning attendees. Uh, we can go ahead and move on to the agenda. So first, I'm going to set some context on what WCS is and how you can get involved. And then we're going to bring in Shai, our keynote speaker, who's going to do his talk on term sheets that integrate impact. Um, if you're a new entrepreneur or looking to become one, this talk is so useful. Like, I feel like no one tells us how financing and fundraising works and what things mean. Um, so this talk is exactly that. Um, sh you are more than welcome to ask questions. In fact, like, please do ask questions during the conversation. You can drop them in the chat. You can reuse the raise hand feature. We definitely want to keep this as more of a conversation. Um, rather than just a presentation. Um, but after the talk, we will also have additional time to ask any further um, questions or um, do any further discussions. And then, of course, the last 30 minutes will be dedicated to just networking. Um, so we're going to do our breakout rooms and, um, yeah, talk to each other and network around. Um, but before we start here, um, here are some tips. For um, Zoom, I'm sure you all know this after three years of virtual meetings, but as a reminder, please write your full name on your Zoom profile. Um, turn on your video if you feel comfortable doing so. We love to see your faces. I know these virtual meetings can be kind of awkward, but we wanna try to keep it as in-person and engaging as we possibly can. Um, WCS volunteers that are on the call can be indicated with the asterisk. Um, our volunteers, if you don't have that, if you can put that on. Um, just so people know, um, definitely feel free to reach out to them if you have any questions about WCS afterwards. Um, please be muted um, unless you are called on to, of course, um, ask a question. Um, just to be respectful um, of the presentation. And of course, we encourage you to share your LinkedIn in the chat so we can all connect with one another and leave with um, additional LinkedIn connections. So first off, um, a little bit about WCS. Um, we are a nonprofit organization originally founded in the San Francisco Bay Area. We have now grown to 13 countries with a membership base of more than 500 professional women and men. The organization aims to support women in their careers in the clean tech and sustainability industries. And we're going on about 13 years now, which is impressive considering we're primarily run by volunteers. Um, we hold virtual events such um, on a monthly basis, such as this one, in-person socials, professional development workshops, um, and we're always coming up with more things. So you can check out all the events on our events page for more information and to register for the upcoming ones. If you are not yet a WCS member, um, I encourage you to sign up. You can scan this QR code. And if you sign up today, you will be reimbursed for today's event. Uh, please feel free to contact me or any one of the WCS um, volunteers and members on the call if you have any questions about the membership experience. If your company is interested in becoming a corporate member, we have that option. Um, so WCS corporate membership is a great way to elevate your corporate brand, offer professional development opportunities to your employees, and get connected with industry professionals from around the world. If you are a WCS member, either through an individual membership or corporate membership, we do have a Slack channel called WCS Connect. Um, our Slack um, is a space for just our members and it's to further 
um, networking and collaboration and have these kind of continued conversations after our events. Um, you can sign in via the mobile app if you are a WCS member. Um, and definitely be sure to join our entrepreneurship Slack channel for um, to keep these conversations going. All right. If you don't already follow us on social media, um, here are our handles. Please follow us or sign up for our newsletter to stay connected and receive information on upcoming events and opportunities. And with that, um, that's all I have for in terms of WCS. Again, thank you for being here. Um, and let's move on with today's keynote speaker. Um, so I wanna welcome uh, Shai Kalinsky, um, who is a legal professional who specializes in corporate and transactional matters, including venture capital, financings, mergers, acquisitions, and security offerings for public and private companies. He works in the climate tech, life sciences, healthcare, hospitality, and technology industries, and has vast experience representing everyone from startups to late stage private companies in the climate tech and sustainability spaces. Additionally, he provides legal, legal advice to investors on climate tech investments, acquisitions, and dispositions, and is a member of um, Morrison Forrester's Global ESG Steering Committee. Uh, Morrison Forrester, also called MoFo, is also a WCS corporate member who we love having in our network and are very excited to have you on today as a speaker. So please welcome me and join um, in welcoming Shai Kalensky to the stage. Thank you for the very nice introduction. Um, first, I'd like to thank WCS for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you all. Second, I promise that I own more than two dress, more than one dress shirt. It just happens to be that I wore the same dress shirt that's in my picture um, unintentionally. And before really diving in, I do want to reiterate that I much prefer that people jump in with questions. I much prefer an engaged and interactive presentation rather than um, a monologue. So feel free to raise your hand, feel free to shout out, just put something in the chat, whatever works. Um, I'm happy to answer things as I go along. <clears throat> so before we really dive in, I th think it's helpful to set the table. Um, I looked at PitchBook this morning, which is an industry research group that publishes data on financings, including in climate tech. And overall, VC financings in climate tech fell from $41 billion in 2023 um, uh, to, sorry, it fell from... 51 billion in 2021 to 41 billion in 2023. And so um, that downward trend, I think, is generally consistent with what we've seen in the market overall um, with regards to financings. Looking at some other industries and sectors, climate tech is doing a little bit better. So we didn't fall as far, um, which is encouraging. And then Q1 of 2024 did show an uptick relative to Q4 of 2023. Uh, although not really um, hard data, I will say that in my practice in the last Q1 was relatively quiet in the last month or so. I've seen a significant uptick in the number of term sheets coming across, which is a good sign. I think it's a good signal that the, the capital markets are beginning to open up. They aren't obviously what they were in 2022, but hopefully um, the worst of the, of the financing market is behind us. The most, the good news is also for founders is most of the deals, like the plurality of deals that we're seeing right now are in the early stages and there are fewer growth and late stage financings. So um, I think that means that the, the spigot is opening up a bit. Um, I think with that, could we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so I, I wanna start at the, at the very basics. If uh, if this is too basic, you people can tell me to sort of go faster or go forward. Um, if anybody has any questions, don't be embarrassed. Feel free to ask whatever you want. Um, I'm happy to answer any question. Uh, as you can see, a term sheet is really just the high level summary of the terms of the financing. You are much better off negotiating the material terms of your financing at the term sheet stage rather than at the definitive documentation stage because it's a lot cheaper. 
and you'll be able to suss out whether there is, in fact, a deal to be had with your counterparty. Um, it, it, it will surface material issues, material discrepancies between your positions, so that when you do get to drafting the definitive documents, you'll still have some stuff to fight about, but it won't be uh, as much. And you'll also know if you know if you if you try and negotiate a term sheet with someone, it'll tell you whether you think it's possible that you'll be able to reach a deal and what it's going to be like to be working with them. If they're too obstreperous, too difficult at the term sheet stage, then you know when you get to the definitive documents or as an investor, it's a it's not it's not guaranteed, but it is a good signal whether it'll be easy to work with them or not. Um so then most folks in venture use what's called the NVCA forms. The NVCA is the National Venture Capital Association. They make their term sheets and their transaction documents available for free uh, on the link below. And um, the term sheet covers these key sections, which I will run through. So the offering terms is really how much people are paying per share, what the pre-money valuation is, and um, what security someone is getting. And I'll dive into that more on the following slides. It summarizes the key terms of the charter. And the charter is also called the Certificate of Incorporation or Articles of Incorporation, which is a publicly filed document that sets forth the terms of the securities, which includes like their rights, their preferences, and their privileges, meaning really the key elements of the stock that they're going to own and what their rights are going to be and what the obligations of the company are going to be in respect of that stock. Then it'll have the, the, the term sheet summarizes some of the key elements of the stock purchase agreement. And the stock purchase agreement is exactly what it sounds like. It's the agreement that governs the purchase of the securities and the, uh, and the entry into the other documents like the investor's rights agreement, the right of first refusal and co-sale, the voting agreement, and a few others. Um, the SPA includes representations and warranties about your company, which are basically statements that you say are true or are not true. And then you have liability if you are materially wrong about those. Um, and we can circle back to that. Um, next, there's the investor's rights agreement, which is an agreement that gives certain key rights to the investors, including registration rights, pro rata purchase rights and future financings, information and inspection rights, and other operational covenants that are requiring the company to do certain things on an ongoing basis. Then there's the right of first refusal and co-sale. And I should note, like, I'm giving you a high level voiceover on these right now. The subsequent slides will do a deeper dive on them. Um, I just kind of want to get people oriented to what we're going to talk about first. So the right of first refusal and co-sale agreement, often just called the ROFR agreement, um, is the key agreement that restricts the sale of stock by the founders and certain key employees. Um, it basically says the founders and certain key employees can't sell top stock to third parties without first giving certain investors the right to buy those shares. And if they choose not to buy those shares, they can sell, the investors can sell alongside the founders and key employees. Then there's the voting agreement, which governs how everybody agrees to vote their shares. And it basically covers off things like how many directors will be on the board, who gets to designate those directors. Um, it includes what's called a drag along, which is a requirement that all stockholders vote in favor of the sale of the company if certain conditions are met. And then there are some other ancillary matters um, about what the conditions to closing are and there's side letters and things like that, but we'll get to those later. So I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, so the offering terms, I touched on this a bit and now I'm gonna do a deeper dive on all these. Um, this really describes what kind of stock you're gonna get uh, in a financing, almost always, not always, but almost always, it is a preferred stock, meaning it has the rights that are superior to the common stock, which is typically what employees and founders receive. Um, the NBCA term sheets covers 
uh, equity securities and not debt securities, if you're early stage or pre-seed round, it may not be the right approach for you to do a priced equity round for a couple of reasons. One, there's a lot of complexity in negotiation. There are certainly significant fees and it could be hard to really value your business at this point. And that's a key element of, of the term sheet is what's the pre-money valuation? What value do the, do the investors ascribe to your business today? In order to avoid that, you could do a non-priced instrument. And there are a couple that are very popular. One is a convertible note, which has some bells and whistles, but basically says that on a future financing, that investor will convert the, into the next equity round. Um, that's something that you probably need counsel to work with uh, because there is a little bit of complexity and nuance there. Another instrument that's very popular in early stage financings is the SAFE, which is a simple agreement for future equity. And that's a really short agreement. It's like three or four pages long. And that can be found on the Y Combinator website. A lot of folks use that for their first financing for like friends and family um, because it's really easy to do. You can, of course, I mean, I'm happy to answer questions about that as well. It isn't the exact focus of this presentation, but for early stage founders, it can be, um, it can be helpful. So next, the term sheet covers off the offering, the, the investors. And the term sheet's typically negotiated between the company and a lead investor or a couple of lead investors. And they set the terms for the round. Everybody else typically just follows what they set. And um, I think I'll pause here because to focus on a bit of the, the impact. When you're looking for your lead investor, I wouldn't just consider who's offering you the highest valuation uh, or um, the, the necessarily the best terms. You should also consider who that investor is and their track record and what they invest in and frankly, what they prioritize, right? Like certain large investors now are requiring their invest are tying the compensation of their investment teams to, to certain hitting key performance indicators, right? These KPIs can often be tied to things like how much has the companies they invested in reduced greenhouse gas. And if these companies do more and reduce green, more greenhouse gas, then the investment professionals make more money. I think that's a really good signal if, so, if, if a fund does that, that they're really committed to, to the impact, right? That Because they're really tying their comp to impact. And then you could also look to see what kind of other companies they've invested in. And I would talk to other folks in the community to see what their reputation is like. You want to make sure that you're finding a really good partner in the early stages, you know, because of that their mission aligned and that they can make good introductions. Okay. So anyway, uh, back to the term sheet. Um, in the investor section, it will also say um, any significant investors that you already know are going to come in. And it typically, not always, but typically gives the lead investor or lead investors the right to reasonably consent to other investors. Uh, it's not always, but people often want to do that, especially in early rounds, because they want to make sure that you're not get, well, there's there's two ways to look at it. They want to keep out competitors sometimes, and sometimes they want to make sure that you're inviting in other funds and investors who are going to be accretive beyond a financial perspective. Um, okay, then the amount raised, we'll talk about exactly that. The amount that you plan to raise in the financing, which could include in that total or not include in that total, any convertible notes or safes that are outstanding. Um, although the amount raised, you it's, it's really a cap on the most you can raise. It's not that you have to raise it all. Typically what happens is, is you say, okay, I've agreed with a lead investor and a few other investors that are going to come in at the first closing, and they're all going to fund and the safes and convertible notes will convert at that time. And then you have a period of 90 to 120 days usually to go find additional investors to raise the, um, 
the difference between what was the aggregate raise and what you've already sold. And it's fair for you to try and push to get a longer period. In fact, I would encourage people to go towards 120 to 150, particularly in this market where it's a bit harder to drum up investors. Um, okay. And then the offering terms include the pre-money valuation. This is the thing that people are most focused on, frankly, because it, um, it will sort of help determine how much dilution you will suffer, right? The pre-money valuation is the value the investors are ascribing to the business. And this is gonna be the focus of your early negotiations. There's no perfect science to this, and it, it's a bit more art than science, frankly. You could look at comps and other things, but at the early stages, it's really a matter of negotiating leverage. And uh, I mean, that, that really is one of the key, the key elements there. Um, and then it will also tell you whether they're including in the pre-money, the, the pre-money considers the shares outstanding and your outstanding option pool, but also quite likely an increase to the option pool. So investors wanna see basically enough shares in the option pool to be able to get you to the next financing, because if they don't, they have to increase the option pool and that will dilute them. They prefer that the existing stockholders bear most of that dilution. And it's really customary for the existing stockholders to, to bear that dilution. Um, I'll pause there. Are there any questions? Does anybody have anything they wanna ask? Were there anything in the chat? Okay, great. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so then uh, the next section of the charter, or sorry, the next section of the term sheet that's really key covers the charter. And the charter is really the key governing document. It is publicly filed and it sets forth the rights of the preferred stock. Um, it'll include what dividends are payable, which is basically a, a percent or a dollar value that the company is expected to pay to the stockholders. In venture, there's usually no dividend because frankly, most of the profits should be reinvested back into the business and into, gr into growth. Um, it, what people typically do agree is that the preferred and common will share equally on any dividends that are declared, but the board doesn't ever really declare dividends. So it's kind of like a, a bit of an illusory right, but early venture investors understand that the board is not intended to declare dividends. And then next there's non-cumulative dividends where the preferred stock will get a specific dollar amount or a percentage out of any dividends declared by the board. And you don't have to pay those to the common, but it's only when, as, and if declared by the board. And as you can see, there's like a lot of lawyerly conditionality in that, which basically means the board doesn't have to do it. It's only if they feel like it. Then the charter will also include the preferred stocks liquidation preference. This is the right that, they, uh, the, that the preferred stock has to proceeds before any of the common gets paid on a liquidation. And a liquidation can be either in an M&A event or if unfortunately the company gets wound down. So the preferred stock sits on top of the capital stack. Well, actually I should take that back. Debt sits on top of the capital stack. Preferred stock sits on top of the equity stack, which is immediately below, below debt. So the liquidation preference is typically one X of what they paid. And then it will also include participation rights. And a participation right is basically once they get their liquidation preference, do they also get to participate in the residual, like whatever's left over? And more often than not, they don't. The, invest, the preferred investors will have to choose to get their liquidation preference or to participate with the common. And they'll, of course, choose to participate if they'd make more money as a common stockholder. One bit of nuance to note is that I would say in the last six months or so, it used to be that, that the liquidation preference was 1x. I've seen 1.5 and 2x creeping in, um, even once 3x in the last six months, just because it's been a harder fundraising market. And so the investors have a bit more leverage. I haven't seen that in every deal, but I've seen it in more than one. And two years ago, I never really saw it. Um, 
if there are multiple series of preferred, and so, you know, this is like a champagne problem, right? Like you've done your first financing and now you're doing your second financing. Uh, the question really is, in terms of liquidation preference, how do the sh how do the preferred stand in, in line? Is it the most recent round gets paid first? So like the C gets paid before the B, before the A, or do they all share equally? That's something that they'll have to negotiate amongst themselves. But, you know, new investors will have a view. Um, in a distressed situation, it's more likely that the, the most recent preferred gets paid entirely before anybody else gets paid. Um, so then, but more typically, it's pari passu, meaning they all share equally. Okay. Then the charter will also include uh, voting rights uh, of the preferred stock and whether they get to elect their own director. Um, each share of preferred usually gets one vote for, per share. And the preferred stock may be entitled to votes separately for certain directors and certain specified matters called uh, protective provisions. Um, can we actually scroll to quickly? I think it's slide 14. Uh, no, keep going, sorry. Uh, I think it's the second to last slide. Go before that, the, uh, appendix two. There we go. Okay, thank you. So these are like the standard protective provisions that are typically included. The the NVCA includes a bunch more, but these are what the ones that are we always see. And it basically says you can't take these actions without the consent of some percentage of the preferred stockholders. Sometimes this vote is done on a series by series basis. So the series A votes separately than the series B. As the company, you would prefer to have all the preferred vote together. It just simplifies it and it's easier to get consent. And so they would get to consent to things like dissolving the company, changing the charter or bylaws, creating additional stock that's senior or pari passu to them, which means you'll need to get their consent to do the next round of financing. Selling uh, crypto, uh, obviously this is recent in the last five years or so, there's a lot of risk with selling crypto and having a coin. Uh, and so a lot of venture investors aren't willing to take that risk. Uh, th they have a right to block uh, redeeming shares or repurchasing stock, except for departing employees. That's the typical exemption. Like if an employee is leaving, you can buy back their shares, but the company can't just offer liquidity to employees without the consent of the uh, preferred. Um, adopting or changing or increasing the number of shares in your option pool, the issuance of any debt, except that there's usually like a, a carve out for either existing debt or trade debt or, you know, a certain agree pre-agreed upon amount of like regular bank debt. Um, they can block the creation of non wholly owned subsidiaries because that's a way to get assets out of the company and then to changes to size of the board because they've agreed to a certain board representation. And if you can change that without their consent, it could substantially dilute their voting power on the board. Um, okay, can we please go back to, to the charter slide? Oh, actually, no, I think we covered everything off there. Can we go to the next slide on that, please? Thank you. Uh, I think, go back one. Yep, great. Thank you. So then there, the preferred stock will convert to common on the occurrence of certain um, events, and it usually converts on a one-to-one -one basis, except for if there's anti-dilution, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So the preferred stock can choose to convert they're usually required to convert on the occurrence of an IPO or a vote of the majority of that class of preferred. Um, the reason that you want to do it on an IPO is because it's really hard to list on an exchange if you have anything other than um, common stock. 
public company investors don't really like to see that on an IPO. Now, the conversion ratio can change if the anti-dilution provisions are um, uh, kicked in. And they really just protect the, the value of the preferred investor's investment. And what it says basically is if you issue, if you sell shares below the price that the current round of protect of preferred investors invested, there's an adjustment to the conversion ratio. There are a number of security issuances that are exempted from this test. So for instance, you can issue options to employees below the price that the preferred investors paid. And in fact, you almost always do. If you try and issue options to employees at the price the preferred paid, I've had this happen probably a dozen times in my career. And a dozen times I told the company not to do that. And a dozen times, three to 12 months later, they called me back and said, we have to fix this problem. The employees are enraged, right? So it's almost, uh, you should always issue below the preferred stock price. Okay, for employees. Sorry, that was a bit of a digression, but uh, a helpful nugget to know. Um, and it's also implicated in the anti the anti dilution is implicated in a down round, meaning if the pre money valuation of the next financing round is less than what the current round is, we adjust the conversion mechanics. Uh, the NVCA includes a number of different mechanics to to adjust the conversion price. The most common by far is the broad-based weighted average where the size of the adjustment depends on the number of shares sold relative to the company's existing swamp stock as well as the stock price. Um, I won't go through that mechanics here, but it's all in the NBCA forms. And if you're deciding really broad-based weighted average is market, everything else is not. Um, and then, so then in addition to the, the stock option issuances, there's a few other um, exemptions from anti-dilution. Like if you're, sometimes you have to give a, a warrant to your landlord or in connection with certain bank financing. Um, there's, a, there's a handful of customary exceptions that are included in the NVCA docs that most people don't fight about. All right, could we go to the next slide, please? Okay, great. So the stock purchase agreement is the is the agreement that governs the purchase and sale of the shares. Uh, I talked about it briefly before, but representations and warranties are statements that you're going to make about the company. There's two types. There are what I would call risk allocation, and there are factual ones. And so a risk allocation one would be something like we we own all of our IP. If it turns out that that is not true, the investor can sue you. An informational rep and warranty would be something like, we have 37 employees. Like they don't really care if you have 37 or 39, it's just for them to get a sense of how big the company is. They probably do care whether you own the IP or not. In fact, I'm certain that they would care about that. Um, there is a standard set of terms of, of reps and warranties and the NDCA. There's some nibbling around the edges, but um, they are pretty standard. I will say that m I've never seen an investor sue a company or a founder for a breach of reps or warranties, except in the case of fraud. Like if you know something is not true and you are deliberately and intentionally hiding it, they're going to sue you. And in fact, that's like one of the things I tell my clients is like, I can protect you from a lot. I cannot protect you from fraud. Like if you are dishonest, then there's not much I can do to help you because honestly, like that's the F word in the law, fraud. Don't do that and you should be okay. Then there's also things that are like regular, there are regulatory covenants. Um, one common one is called the Committee on Foreign Investments in the United States. This was created a while ago, but has certainly become more, this committee has become more active in the last three to five years. And they're basically ensuring that um, foreign governments that we don't like aren't investing in critical infrastructure uh, or anything that implicates national security. So if you're taking money from Chinese investors that are connected to the um, to the PRC government, 
that could be complicating for you and it could delay closing. And then the other one is called HSR, which is the Hart Scott Rodino Act. This is antitrust. Um, if an investor is making an investment above a certain threshold that changes every year, um, it could require consent of um, the regulators. And then the stock purchase agreement also includes um, counsel and expenses, which basically says that the company will reimburse the lead investor or the lead investors up to a certain dollar amount for uh, the expenses of their counsel in preparing the documents. It's really important to have a cap in there. I did a deal in December where um, we pushed for a cap. Our client didn't insist on it, so we lost the point. And because the investor told them that they would, there's no way that they would um, do incur more than X dollars of fees. And um, the negotiations weren't difficult or protracted, so it wasn't us. They ended up being 3X what they had said they wouldn't go over. So it imposes a lot of discipline on the investors for you to impose this, uh, to, to insist on this. It also means that it creates a disincentive for them to be obstreperous because if they know you're going to pay for them being obstreperous, there's not really much of a downside for them. Um, okay. Could we go to the next slide, please? All right. It will. The term sheet will also cover off the investor's rights agreement. This is one of the form NBCA documents. Um, there is, of course, some variability and optionality in the documents. Um, one of the one of the first things that's in there is the registration rights. And that's that upon certain triggers, the investors can require the company to list their shares publicly so that an investor can sell them freely. Um, nobody really does this. Like it's nobody wants to force a company to IPO before they're ready. So I don't really lose a lot of sleep over this specific provision because I've never really seen it get used. Um, then there are management and information rights. And this is the rights that the lead investor and that certain venture funds, um, sorry, this is the right that major investors will get to, to certain information about the company, the ability to inspect the company's premises, to receive financial statements and so forth. Uh, separately, the lead investor and uh, certain venture funds will require what's called a management's right letter which is separate from the investor's rights agreement. It's a standalone agreement that gives them many of these rights, even if they stop being major investors. And the reason for that is that a lot of funds re rely on an exemption from ERISA, which is like the, the retirement uh, law that allows them to go and invest in uh, retirement funds if they have a management's rights letter, meaning that they can help manage the business. There's this, again, there's a little bit of nuance in some Funds have their own peculiarities, but by and large, it's a standardized document. Um, I will say that uh, some investors will push push for information rights to include audited financial documents. Um, it depends on your stage of development, but that usually, like the juice, usually is not worth the squeeze there in the early stages. Uh, you're just your books aren't sophisticated. There's a lot of there's a lot of cost imposed upon you and a lot of process imposed on you to do that. If, if the things I would fall back to, if they really insist, is to have your books reviewed, not audited, which is cheaper, like the auditing firms will charge you less. Um, a pro tip is that if you can do off cycle review, it's even cheaper. So like if you can have your, your financial year close at a weird time, like the end of July, the, the auditors aren't as busy then and they're often do it for less money. And the other thing I would typically push for is if they really want audited books, say that agree that we'll do it in two to three years, that for the first two to three years, we don't have to get our books audited because it doesn't make sense. But once the company has grown, we'll, we'll do that. Um, the IRA, the Investor's Rights Agreement also inclu includes the right to purchase additional shares in future financings, which is uh, called the preemptive right. Uh, it lets it lets investors maintain their position in the company and future financings. It may also specify certain matters that require director preferred director approval, right? 
the 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 preferred investors can get protection two ways. One is how they can consent to things in their capacity as stockholders. And then two, in the way they can consent to fit that their director has a right to consent to certain things in its capacity as a as a as a director. As the company, you want to push as much as you can to the director approval. Because a stockholder can withhold its consent for basically any reason, because they're acting in their own financial best interest. The preferred director approval comes with fiduciary duties, which are duties that directors owe to all stockholders, not just the investors that appointed them. So um, that will require that they think long and hard about approving something as a director, because they could have personal liability if they don't act in accordance with their fiduciary duties. And then there are other covenants. There are non-competition agreements. Um, this is kind of funny. I think this is something that's gonna go on its way out. Non-compete non agreements aren't really enforceable in California. And the FTC just came out with proposed rules that says they're probably gonna be unenforceable in the United States. So I expect that the non-competes are gonna go away. Non-competes are really only enforceable on the sale of a business. Not if you like work for somebody and then go work somewhere else. Um, the other covenants include the non-disclosure, non-solicitation and development agreements or sometimes called a proprietary information and inventions yeah. assignment agreement. Um, so basically that just says like people have to sign their IP to the company. Then there's some uh, board matters and employee stock option. Basically everybody vests on a prescribed schedule. Um, I think we can go to the, the next slide. Um, I'm going to pause here again. I, I feel like I've been talking for quite a while. Does anybody have any questions that have come up so far? I have a question. Sure. So the um, on the previous slide, is that all one document or are they all different addendums that are brought up at different points in time? That was my first question. So great question. That's all in one document. Um, except for the management's rights letter, which is a separate document, but the rest of it is all included in the investor's rights agreement. Okay. And that's all created right off the bat and you help the founders and whoever is starting uh, the company come up with all of this in the very beginning. Yep. Okay. So typically the way it works is that the term sheet will say that counsel to the company is the one that drafts the documents and you as the founder really want that, right? Because Although mm -hmm. the term sheet's written a certain way, you can sh in drafting, you can shade things to be a little bit more favorable to the company. So we'd rather start with us preparing, the, us as company counsel, preparing the documents so we can like shade the document in your favor. And of course we'll negotiate, but um, if we, they have, it's better to negotiate from what we wrote than from what they wrote because they're gonna shade it in their favor. Okay. And then when you say, thank you, when you say preferred director, is that an employee of the company or is that? Good question. No, typically um, that's and somebody appointed by the, the lead investors fund. Got it. And, and they get to pick. Sometimes they'll get more than one director. Um, like if it's a, it's a board of five folks, they might get two directors and, you know, the CEO, the founders would be on the board and there might be like, you know, some advisor that's been helping them. Uh, more often than not, in early stage, I see it being three directors, one mm -hmm. or two appointed by the preferred, and then the CEO and founder. Okay, awesome. And and you brought up something else in your answer, which uh, brought me to uh, think about, um, what about advisors and where do they fall in? Because uh, I know they, um, startup companies do usually allocate some sort of stock or equity to advisors as well? Or are you planning to cover this at some point down the line? I was not. So it's a great question. Um, uh, the, the investor rights agreement will tell you how the, the vesting terms for employees and officers and directors, but it doesn't cover off advisors. And advisors typically vest on a two-year term rather than a four-year term. And so advisors usually get fewer shares of stock and they, they vest over two years uh, on a monthly basis. There's no cliff. Employees usually have to be there for a year before their options start to vest. It's not that way with advisors typically. They, they vest automatic, or they vest after the first month. And um, 
the, one of the reasons is because advisors typically don't stick around for their full two years. Like they're mm -hmm. helpful. They get you off the ground and then, you know, thank you very much. You did a great job, but we don't need you anymore. Um, so that's why it's month to month rather than the same way that an employee best. It's a really good question. I should probably cover that off going forward. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, how are we doing on time? I think we're good. Um, yeah, if we keep pausing for questions, we got about, I think, 15 more minutes. Okay. Great. Um, so the right of first refusal and co-sale agreement. This is a really important agreement for you as the founder um, because it will encumber your ability to sell stock. Uh, you as the founder are really like the, the secret sauce to the company, right? Like people are betting on you usually. You have a good idea and, and, and that's why they're willing to invest, but they're looking at you as the key one to drive the business forward. So they wanna make sure that you stay engaged going forward. And one way to do that is to ensure that you can't sell your stock. Like if you could exit the business, then your motivation to keep working falls substantially. So what they're gonna say is that before you can sell your stock, you know, if you go find somebody to buy it, um, you can, you first have to offer it to the company. And then to the extent the company doesn't buy your shares, uh, the, the key, the lead investors or the, the major holders can buy your shares instead. What that does really is it has a huge chilling effect on your ability to sell your shares because nobody wants to go through the time of engaging with you, doing diligence, getting comfortable about the business, looking at the financials only to find out that the deal was taken away from them by someone else. Um, and then even if, the comp even if the company and the major holders don't exercise their right of first refusal, they have the right to sell alongside you pro rata to their ownership. So let's just assume after a series A, they own about 25% of the business. Uh, and let's just say you own the other 75%. You'll only be able to sell three quarters of your shares and they can sell... Uh, their shares, right? Like whatever, if the investor is going to buy a hundred shares, you can sell 75 and the major holders will be able to sell 25, which again, reduces your economics and the incentive for you to sell. Um, there are usually a few exceptions here. One is you can transfer for estate planning purposes, right? Like if you set up a family trust or whatever, you can move your shares into that, no problem. Or you set up uh, several trusts for the benefit of your kids or whoever you like. Um, you can usually move it into, into those trusts. And then there's what I like to call the, I live in San Francisco and I need to buy a house exemption, um, which basically says you can sell like a couple million dollars of stock if you live in the Bay Area to go buy yourself a house because uh, houses are so expensive in the Bay Area. I guess maybe I should stop saying San Francisco. Houses are so expensive everywhere now. So a lot of times founders ask for the ability to sell just a little bit of their stock so they can have a down payment on a house. Um, I've seen that. And that's honestly pretty compelling, right? Like you're working really hard. You want to buy a house. You can't do it because like everything you have and everything you're building is tied up in this business. And it's hard for you to get the money you need to go buy a house. So oftentimes that's like a pretty winning and sympathetic argument to make. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. So then there's the voting agreement. And the voting agreement basically says everybody agrees to vote their shares in accordance with this agreement, and it covers a few things. One, the size of the board. We touched on this a bit before, but investors don't want you changing the size of the board because it could change their power on the board, right? If all of a sudden you go from three to seven directors and they only have one seat, their vote's kind of meaningless. Um, and then who has the right to designate the directors? And so sometimes, almost always, the, the common have a director and it's the CEO. They may have a couple more directors in the early stages. There's a preferred one or more preferred directors. And then you could have an independent director. I really like the independent director. You have to make sure you have a good independent director, somebody who is legitimately independent and adds value. Typically that I, I see somebody adding value if they have good industry connections, if they've taken a company, uh, if they've helped grow a business before. Um, it can often be like your jungle guide as the founder, right? It's like the other person that you call up and say, hey, I don't know what to do here. What do you think I should be doing? And they should be helping you work through those problems. 
I think it's it's really helpful uh, to have the independence. And, you know, uh, it gives the directors, uh, sorry, the preferred some comfort that it's not just like your best friend on the board who will vote however you tell them. Um, that helps bridge some of the gap with uh, preferred uh, investors wanting more board seats. If you can designate an independent director that they get a reasonable right to approve, that lets you pick somebody who you think is going to be reasonably friendly to you, but has good judgment and who isn't beholden to you, which makes it easier for their preferred investors to accept. And then there's also the drag along. The drag along is kind of funny. It basically says that if the board, a majority of the preferred and the, the founders vote for a transaction, everybody has to vote in favor of a sale transaction. So like if you're gonna sell your company, it requires by, by law, it requires a majority of the stockholders to approve it. Um, this makes sure that everybody has to vote for it. And the reason that is, is because an acquirer, like when I'm on the buyer side, we always look to see who's going to vote for the transaction. Because the worst thing that can happen as a buyer is that somebody doesn't like the deal and then sues you um, because they didn't vote for the deal. What this says is anybody who signs the voting agreement can't sue you. They have to vote for the deal. Nobody really ever uses the drag along because if you really expect that much resistance, like if your investors really hate the deal, you're probably not going to do it. This has a this is really good at like kind of sweeping up the small investors who aren't that engaged and who aren't likely to vote for it, but probably just aren't going to vote for anything anyway because like they ignore your emails. Um, okay, I don't like I said I don't see the drag exercised. I see it more as a club to to herd people along. Um, okay, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, okay, so then a couple things to keep in mind here is um, if all of your shares are fully vested already as the founder, there's a really good chance that they're going to subject all or a portion of your shares to revesting. It's as if, meaning that if you stop working for the company, um, typically only if you're fired for a cause, um, uh, or you leave without good reason that you forfeit a portion of your shares. And that's just a way to keep you engaged. Uh, the counter argument obviously is like you worked to start this thing. You've put a lot of time and money and effort into it. So you shouldn't subject all of your shares to revesting. Um, it's really a matter of negotiation of how much has to be revested if your shares aren't already subject to vesting. When I found companies, like when I'm helping founders start a business, I typically already include um, vesting in their shares. And the reason for that is that you can then tell investors in a year or two when you're raising money, like, look, my, I could already lost my shares and there's a portion I can still lose. We shouldn't resubject them to vesting. Like I'm already engaged and I could have lost this already. And oftentimes that's a pretty compelling argument. Then another point of the term sheet uh, is that what happens with the existing preferred? Uh, this is only applicable in the later rounds. So let's say you've done your A or your C already. The, the following round, the A or the B, then has to kind of negotiate with the existing investors to make sure that they're comfortable with the changes to their rights and privileges. And then finally, the term sheet also includes a few provisions that um, are really important. One, that it's not binding. Like you're not bound to do a deal. Like you could get in to the deal and find out that you don't like this investor, you don't want to do a deal with them. Or conversely, they could start doing diligence about your company and find that either you don't own the IP or there are some like skeletons in the closet that they're not interested in being associated with or whatever it is. So they can like, you know, walk away from the deal. And then there's an obligation to keep the term sheet confidential, except for other investors that you're going to bring into the deal. Um, and the rest of the term sheet really isn't binding. All right. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? Okay, fantastic. So then finally here, we have the ESG specific terms. Um, at the beginning, I covered off like how you wanna make sure that your investor is gonna be mission aligned. Like it's really important if you're a mission driven company to make sure that there are mission aligned investors. Um, and to circle back to some of that, it's basically you should consider what commitments they have towards their LPs and how their economics work to see if they really gonna, if they don't talk, if they talk the talk, are they also gonna walk the walk? 
Now, some other things that they may request is a truly uh, impact-focused investor is going to have obligations to report to its limited partners, meaning the investors in its fund, um, uh, th on things like the reduction of greenhouse gases, um, how they've reduced or sequestered greenhouse gases, their methodology for ca calculation, um, climate risk analysis, and so forth. So they're going to need that information from you. Um, and that will require that you do some work to gather this information. Uh, it seems a bit daunting, but there's a lot of services that you can subscribe to that help you calculate this um, online. There's, you know, if anybody has any questions, I can recommend a few, none of which are my clients, but which I've seen are pretty good. Um, and then they will, uh, a really mission aligned investor will ask for some mission lock mechanisms, which basically could tie executive compensation to meeting certain ESG metrics. I've been focusing on climate because, um, you know, <laughs> WSC, it seems to be more focused on climate, but like there could be other things like human rights too, right? Like how you treat your employees, like what the wages are, like whether you adopted certain policies that are employee favorable, those could all be important to an investor as well. Um, there could be, I, I listed before the basic protective provisions that you see in the NVCA, they don't have the ESG provisions, but it could be important for a mission aligned investor to get protective provisions that you can't change. Like I'm just making one up that you can't change the nature of the business without their consent. So let's just say you have a carbon direct capture business. You can't all of a sudden go into like oil exploration or fracking without their consent, right? Then um, it could require one of the other protective, oh, sorry, what are the other mission lock mechanisms we see is diversity and inclusion provisions on the board. Like they wanna make sure that there's a good cross section and that you're including underrepresented communities uh, on their on your board. Um, if you if you stray from your ESG and mission, they could require that you buy back their shares. Um, and then they there could be carve outs to the drag along. Um, so for instance, if you're if you are again a direct capture business and you're going to sell your company to a big oil company uh, in exchange for stock, it's possible that a mission aligned investor does not want to own big oil stock. So they don't have to vote for the transaction and in fact can say no and sue um, to block the transaction. Um, so I kind of covered off a lot. That's kind of the end of, of the presentation. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, my contact info is on the next slide. I am happy to answer any questions. If you take a shot of the um, QR code, it'll take you to my uh, bio. Oh, yep. Sorry, question. Yeah, thank you so much, Shai. Um, I know for WCS, we get a lot of people who want to start a business. And I was wondering if you have any um, advice for like where to start, any recommendations on diving deeper into yeah. some of these topics, any, any kind of resources or advice that you have? Yeah. I'm, first of all, I'm happy to chat with anybody, I like to give anybody 15 minutes of my time to just sort of get them oriented. Um, but by and large, the key elements are to make sure that your company owns the IP that you're creating. Um, and so as, as you start to work towards putting together a business, it, it's important that like you're mindful of who's creating ideas and that they get into the business. So like if you have a friend, just for example, who created a logo for you and like that, that's a really important part of your brand. You want to make sure that that friend assigns that logo to your company. Um, if you have a friend who created a, a patentable device, you want to make sure they assign it to the company. Um, and then there's, there's a lot of complexity about forming an entity that it's kind of hard to cover off in, in this, but again, I'm really happy to answer questions for people. If the QR code is there, feel free to reach out at any time. I'd be happy to chat more. Awesome. And I'm going to ask one more question, um, kind of at the yeah. elephant in the room, but um, female entrepreneurs, uh, we face specific barriers. Um, the entrepreneurship space, male dominated, the investor space and just financing in general, male dominated. What any kind of advice you or any of your colleagues would 
give to female entrepreneurs? Um, I appreciate that, that is 100% true. It's hard for me to advise given that uh, the life I've lived is as a white male. So I, I, I haven't, um, my, 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 I guess my advice would be to find mentors and supporters who can help you sort of navigate that as you're going through the process. Um, I don't really have a blanket statement or advice, but if, if you're not sure, there are lots of people who are willing to help you. I'm happy to be helpful um, and rely on those people as you navigate what could be a tricky situation. So thank you again for including me. Uh, I appreciate everybody making the time and, and joining. If you have, have any questions, I really do mean it. QR code is there for a reason. Feel free to uh, shoot me a note or give me a call. I'd be delighted to chat more. Thank you so much, Shai. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Well, have Take a care. great weekend. You as thank well. you. Awesome. Well, uh, before we head off into our breakout rooms, I uh, just wanted to let you know that our next meeting is going to be on June 21st. And we have uh, not one, but two speakers coming on. Um, so Ella Hazard with Actur Adventures and then Valentina uh, Rapa with Ripley. Um, and they're going to talk about hybrid teaming and entrepreneurship entrepreneurship as more of a mindset rather than a role. Um, so definitely be sure to sign up for that conversation if you have not already. Um, and we also have plenty of other upcoming events um, to get involved with. Um, the LA chapter is going to host a kind of celebratory event in Santa Monica on June 4th. June 7th, save the date. This is our sixth annual WCS pitch competition, completely virtual. Um, we're going to be showcasing 10 amazing women-led startups. Um, so please come and join us. It's always a fun kind of competition. Um, next slide. Um, we also have on June 14th, a WCS member meet and greet. So this is only open to WCS members. Come network with us um have a good time um and then on june 22nd the sf chapter is going to have another beach cleanup and then this is super important on june 26th um that we are launching our new york chapter so if you are located in new york uh please come out join us uh, learn more about wcs tell your friends um Kerpa is one of the co-chairs. She's on our call today. Um, we're so excited to offer this expansion. Um, and yeah, we hope to see you there. Next up, um, we have a merch store. Just wanted to uh, plug that one more time. If you um, use code WCS15OFF, you will get 15% off your next purchase. And um, thank you to our lovely volunteers. We really can't do these events without you. Um, and we're so appreciative that you take the time to keep these events up and running.